Hello, I'm Tony Perkins, President of the Family Research Council here in Washington, D.C. And I want to thank you for joining us for this special program on trial, freedom versus government health care. Two years ago, President Obama signed into law the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, more commonly known as Obamacare. This law represents the greatest government overreach in American history. And its tentacles are poised to reach even further when it's fully activated in 2014. Just yesterday, however, the U.S. Supreme Court began three days of oral arguments regarding the law's validity. The matter being considered is one that will personally impact every single American. Experts warn that Obamacare will lower the quality of health care in the United States. But poor health care is just the beginning of the ills associated with the hallmark of the Obama administration. This far-sweeping legislation codifies the president's philosophy that the so-called right to health care trumps Americans' First Amendment right of religious freedom. Religious organizations are already being threatened with steep fines for refusing to compromise on core biblical teachings and practices. Religious organizations that have been key providers of health care, providing almost 20% of the hospital care in the United States, may be forced to close their doors in the face of heavy government fines. Catholic hospitals alone treat one out of every six patients in the U.S. What if we lost 20% of our health care delivery system overnight? Could an even greater health care crisis be on the horizon if the court does not overturn Obamacare? Well, one question that has been asked, if the federal government can require you to buy a prescribed health care plan, what then is beyond the reach of a federal mandate? That will be one of the many questions we answer tonight. Over the course of the next hour, we're going to take an in-depth look at the threat that Obamacare poses both to us as individuals and to us as a nation. I'll be joined by an impressive lineup of congressional leaders, doctors, legal experts, and grassroots activists to discuss what has happened to date, the court case, the implications of the court's decision, and the future of freedom in America. These individuals recognize the danger of this government takeover of health care and have been at the forefront of this fight from the very beginning. For individual liberty in general, the need could not be more urgent. The court must decide if we are a nation governed by law that recognizes our inalienable rights of freedoms and, or if we're a nation governed by a coercive, all-powerful federal government. In short, what is on trial before the Supreme Court this week is freedom versus government health care. Well, my first guest this evening is uh, someone who has been very involved uh, in this case from the very beginning. Uh, he is uh, the director of FRC Center for Religious Liberty, Ken Kulkowski. He authored the amicus brief that District Court Judge Roger Vinson heavily relied upon in his decision declaring Obamacare unconstitutional in January of 2011. Ken has attended the first two days of oral arguments at the Supreme Court and is here to provide a behind-the-scenes view of what is taking place. Ken, welcome to the program. Tony, great to be with you. Thanks well, for having me. What's your, uh, your first impressions of the first two days? Well, the first day is just something for law geeks like myself, and that is whether an old law called the Anti-Injunction Act uh, doesn't allow federal courts to have jurisdiction to hear all of these big issues with Obamacare until after the individual mandate kicks in, which happens in 2014. Uh, I think they knocked that one out the park. Who knows, that may even be unanimous. I think both sides, judicially speaking, want to get to the underlying issues here. Just first of all, the Anti-Injunction Act is not a statute that strips the courts of any jurisdiction. Even if it did, it wouldn't apply to the states, and 26 states are suing the federal government here. And even if it did, it would only apply to tax penalties associated with Obamacare, not the individual mandate, which isn't a tax. It's the government telling you that you have to enter into a contract with a private business and give them your money. So for all those reasons, we're going to get past that. Today was the big day, mm -hmm. and this is what everyone was so interested in. Whether under Section 1501 of Obamacare, the infamous individual mandate, whether the federal government has the power to compel you to go out and buy something, to do something with your own private money. And it's not about health care. It's about government power. There's nothing, if they could do this, there's nothing to say they can't tell you what kind of so car to the, buy or house. The court will be looking at the principle behind this of the, of the government mandating you purchasing something. It, it will not specifically be addressing the health care, but rather 
the power of government to, to force you. That's right. That's what's all about this case, Tony, is with the individual mandate, it's not about health care. It's about our whole constitutional form of government. The difference between the federal government and the states is that the federal government is one of limited powers. The legal term we use is enumerated powers, right. meaning everything it does must be found in some provision of the U.S. Constitution. Since there is no health care provision, the question is, where does this power come from? And they just say, well, your decision of whether to buy something impacts interstate commerce, so we can cover it under the Commerce Clause. But if they could do that, your decision to talk with me right now is your decision not to buy a hamburger. The government could command you to go buy a hamburger, go buy a cup of coffee, go buy health insurance. So if they can do this, it will totally transform forever our Of course, of we've, we've seen the, the expansion of government, but this was a leap in, the, in assuming power on behalf of the federal government. Now, the, the issue of the mandate is the argument, but the, the point that you brought out in Amicus Brief that I mentioned that uh, Judge Vinson uh, cited in the first case in, in Florida that overturned uh, Obamacare was an issue of severability, which is just as important before the Supreme Court as it was in that case in Florida. Explain that to our viewers. Well, that's absolutely right. And it's an issue we'll only reach if, if the individual mandate is struck down. And I should say I'm guardedly optimistic that will happen because Justice Kennedy said, if we go with you on this to the government, he says it will, it will fundamentally transform the relationship of the federal government to the individual. So it means that it looks like we've got five votes that they get what's at stake. If they strike that down, the individual mandate for all of its power is only one section in a 450 section law. So the question is, do we only strike down that section, which is what normally happens, or is it so central to the whole system created by the Obamacare law that you have to take down the whole law with it, and that'll be the argument before the court tomorrow. And, and for the benefit of our listeners, the severability clause is when you, one portion is struck down, the remainder stays in place. But here, and we're even hearing this today uh, on the news accounts, that if they lose the mandate, that's really the, the mechanism that makes this work. It's the funding mechanism that makes it happen because everybody has to be a part of it. If the mandate goes, uh, and then the severability clause that's not there is, is uh, recognized, the whole thing is gone. That's right. Uh, the Supreme Court has explained that severability is all about congressional intent. Would Congress be satisfied with the rest of the law? Can it still function the, the way, in the manner, that Congress intended? Since, as you said, everything else in the law is about creating new health care systems, the only way to fund it, and even then the, the, the numbers don't add up, but the only way they can try and argue to fund it is to make tens of millions of young, healthy people buy insurance paying thousands of dollars more than they would otherwise have to in order to finance all these other things. You take down the individual mandate and you're looking at a trillion dollars of additional cost that would totally uh, upend our entire private health care system in this country. Ken, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate your insights uh, into this case and as well as your work uh, on the, uh, the amicus brief. That was Thank you, Tony. Court. Appreciate it. <laughs>